there's a lot of people out there who talk about embodiment and the phenomenological notion of embodiment. The book that I would recommend for people if they want to read a really interesting book, this is one called The Absent Body, and it's by True Leader. True Leader is a phenomenologist and a medical doctor. Uh, he is a professor of philosophy at Loyola College in Maryland. This is a book that he does, and I think, as I said before, few people are as interesting in their address of what it means to be a body. Now, as you can just see by the title, the absent body is the way that he wants to address the body. And what he's trying to do is differentiate between the body as cadaver, sadly, uh, the, or the body as it appears to the doctor as an object of medicine there from a third-person perspective, sort of a thingly object in the world. And we could, we could deal with embodiment in terms of materiality, but we could also deal with embodiment as an absent body. And so here what we're talking about is embodiment as a body as it is in its flight away from itself in its concern toward the world. So I have hands and my hands are a flight outside themselves. So much of the world was made by hands and for hands. There's doorknobs and light switches and all kinds of things within reach. If I just look at any room, it's spatialized and organized to give access to my hands. There's a handiness to the world and it's largely because my hands can become transparent in grasping what they are. My body itself is normally transparent as well. This is why, again, why he calls it an absent body. Normally, the healthy body is a kind of flight outside itself, beyond itself. You're transparently caught up in the world of engagements and involvements, and you reach out toward the world and only when there's a dysfunction or a moment of breakdown do the processes of your body, the fleshy materiality, come to your awareness, right? So, uh, for example, in a normal healthy body, your digestive system might in fact be quite transparent. If suddenly you eat something that isn't good for your system or if you have indigestion, suddenly your body may actually become aware of your system. Uh, your stomach may rumble, you may feel uh, inward senses of your materiality that previously were just uh, beyond or below recognition. If your eyes, uh, they, when you look around, your eyes are absent in that the one thing that you don't see as you're looking around is your eyes. Well, at least you don't see them if they're well-functioning. If you're experiencing a dysfunction and suddenly you see spots in your eyes, that's one of the first signs that there's something wrong with your sight and you need to go have your vision corrected. But your senses are flights outside themselves. They make room for what they're not. And this is true of all of the senses, right? This is so why it's so important to understand that the meaning of embodiment isn't just that consciousness is always in the flesh or that consciousness is always uh, of the body. That's part of what the meaning of embodiment is, but the more significant meaning of embodiment is that to be a body more than just a cadaver or as a medical body, to be a body as we exist as a body or to be a living body is to be a flight outside yourself. It's to be caught up in the world that becomes disclosed and is made possible through your very absence, through the clearing of your eyes, through the clearing of your headlessness, through your hands and your hands ability to reach out into the world, the world itself becomes open and manifest in various ways. Now, the world and yourself, your body, they do become explicitly, consciously dealt with in moments of breakdown. And it's very, you know, interesting how Leader deals with this. He differentiates between what he calls the disappearance of the body, the D-I-S-S-A, you know, the disappearance, as the natural functioning of the body, from the disappearance, the D-Y-S, as in dysfunction. And there is a kind of dysfunction that happens. You can see 
how in moments of bodily failure or bodily breakdown, we become um, actually aware of our body in certain ways. The other can hail us as another and render us as an object, right? Can make us seem to be less than adequate. There's so many other ways that the body as thingly appears in a sort of moment of breakdown, right? It's disease, it is moments of pain, it's moments of uh, function breakdown, but it's also the presence of others who can call us into question, who can see us amidst the things of the world and ask about the propriety of our relation to the larger things of the world. I think one of the things that's most interesting about leaders' work, and then I'll leave this at, uh, you know, rec just recommend that people go check the book out if they want to see it, is that I think all of the things that are said about the body and the notion of the absent body, they probably could be, and I think they have been well said about language. Language itself is a kind of materiality, and it's the materiality of thought, but language is an absent body. It's a materiality whose natural function is to be transparent. It's to be a clearing whose absence makes room for thought. It is the material ground that reaches out toward eidetic realities to what we call meaning or thought or mind stuff or whatever that mental life is. It is something that's possible by way of a language which is self-effacing. The, the very self-effacingness of language. When I sit down with a book and as I get lost in the book, the words on paper disappear and I simply deal in the meaning. And it's only in the moment of misspelling, the moment of breakdown, the moment of dysfunction, when suddenly the materiality of the word reappears. I think the more that we can understand the nature of the body as an absent body and the more that we understand language as its own kind of absent body, the more we can get a clue of, I think this is what Polanyi means by the tacit dimension, it's the more that we can understand the very nature of our relationship to the larger world and to the earth, right? I think this is, you know, his sort of final point as he ends the, again, this very interesting book that I do, do think people would want to, uh, you know, check out if you haven't uh, seen this, The Absent Body, uh, is he talks about to form one body. What would it mean for people to recognize themselves as kind of one body, which I think is sort of what uh, Kessler's going for in his Ghost in the Machine, you know, when he talks about the whole on and, uh, really can't say all of what he's going to say here, but he just says, you know, the first universal characteristic of hierarchies is the relativity and indeed ambiguity of the terms part and whole when applied to any of the sub-assemblies. Again, it is the very obviousness of this feature which makes us overlook its implications. A part, as we generally use the word, means something fragmentary and incomplete, which by itself would have no legitimate existence. On the other hand, a whole is considered as something complete in itself, which needs no further explanation. But wholes and parts in this absolute sense just do not exist anywhere, either in the domain of living organisms or of social organizations. I do. I think there is a larger whole, and that larger whole is meant to be sort of transcended toward as the parts become transparent in reaching out toward those larger holes. Uh, thanks.